following docudrama is based on interviews with eyewitnesses and published findings. Some dialogue has been fictionalized. April 22, 1997, Lima, Peru. Peruvian special forces prepare to storm the Japanese ambassador's residence. At stake, the lives of 72 men held hostage by a revolutionary guerrilla movement. A deadly game is in play for the lives of the hostages. On one side is a desperate man willing to kill for the woman he loves. His adversary, a ruthless and corrupt political czar. And at the heart of the siege, the man who risks his own life to become a hero. p.m. April 22nd 1997 this is the story of the last hour of the last day of a siege that lasted four months in December 1996 the Japanese ambassador to Peru hosted a pre Christmas cocktail party for Lima's elite among the 600 guests was British journalist Sally Bowen we were talking around the idea of whether Peru was now really a neoliberal paradise or whether there could be remnants of terrorism still around when suddenly there was a loud bang I think all came to more or less the same conclusion that it was probably a, a, a small car bomb maybe in the street until suddenly the firing started uh, I remember just trying to imagine what what it would feel like when the bullet hit flesh Amazingly, about a dozen guerrillas took 600 of Peru's most powerful people hostage in a matter of moments. Two of the guerrillas were teenage girls. They were also explosive experts. That night, they mined the doors. The hostages were sealed in the guerrillas' trap. managed to get a sort of sideways look and um, I could see three gorillas in um, black knitted hoods over their heads. The leader of the gorillas is Nesta Serpa Cartellini a former Labour leader whose desperate act is driven by Marxist beliefs and love. His wife is a political prisoner in Peru, and he wants to exchange his hostages for her release. The Tupac Amaru Revolutionary Movement, or MRTA, has a deadly history of kidnapping and killing their hostages. This Tupac Amaru video shows the guerrillas hid in an ambulance drove to the back of the Japanese ambassador's garden and blew a hole in the wall. They seized the building in minutes. The, the fact that 14 guerrillas could take over uh, a heavily guarded embassy uh, residence where, where there were about 600 guests is really nothing short of extraordinary. Serpa was shrewd. He knew his small gang of 14 couldn't control 600 hostages, but he had some of Peru's most important people in his hands, including the foreign minister. He would be one of Serpa's main bargaining chips. Serpa released his less prestigious prisoners, the waiters, maids, and cooks. One military hostage made a run for it. The 
the Tupac Amaru next released all the women. Before journalist Sally Bowen left, she managed to get an interview with the guerrilla's leader. I asked him what his objectives in the action were. He wanted to gain the release of MRTA prisoners, who he considered to be prisoners of war. He said that the prison conditions were inhumane. Um, he said, for example, that children of somebody who was imprisoned on a terrorist charge were never allowed to touch their parent. So he said, this is what terrorism does. Terrorism is self-sustaining because it breeds hatred. Um, you breed hatred in the children um, against the system that treats their parents so inhumanely. When I said goodbye to the people I knew, I said, don't worry, I'm sure you'll all be out of here tomorrow. I mean, I could not have been more wrong. Peruvian President Alberto Fujimori refused to give in to the guerrillas' demands. No se puede hablar de paz ni de acuerdo mientras se utiliza el terror como principal argumento. Over the weeks that followed, Nestor Serpa released hundreds more hostages in the hope of concessions from the president, but he got none. In January 1997, he dug in his heels. Serpa announced that no more hostages would be released. 72 remained in captivity. Serpa ordered them held on the main floor of the Japanese ambassador's residency. Makeshift mattresses and blankets formed their sleeping quarters. The Peruvian government had shut off all power and water. Hostages and guerrillas alike had little food or drinking water and no toilets. One hostage was offered his freedom, but refused. Jesuit father Juan Julio Vict had a clear message for the guerrilla leader. Mr. Serpa, I am a Catholic priest. I will remain here until the last hostage has left. I stay for solidarity and for moral support. At 2.32 p.m. on April the 22nd, the one man ruthless enough to destroy Serpa prepares to launch his deadly attack, one he has been planning for months. Vladimir Amatisinos is Peru's supreme head of intelligence. The president has secretly ordered him to plan an armed rescue attempt. Montesinos is a very ruthless man. He's very calculating, can be chillingly cold. Montesinos had really got control of virtually every element that was important in Peruvian life. Montesinos has earned his reputation as a brilliant but brutal political boss, a man who has risen to power through cunning and fear. He is one of President Fujimori's most trusted aides. In public, Fujimori promised to talk with Tupac Amaru. In private, he had given Montesinos authority to wipe the guerrillas out by whatever means necessary, without killing the hostages. His plan, to build tunnels directly below the Japanese ambassador's residence, to launch surprise commando attacks, and to place a massive explosive directly under the Tupac Amaru's headquarters in the ballroom. The problem is, some of the hostages could be blown to bits along with the terrorists. Serpa has threatened to kill the hostages if his demands are not met. What he does not know is that Montesinos has a secret weapon. One of the hostages, codenamed the Sea, has a direct line of communication with Montesinos. The fate of the 72 hostages lies in his hands. Sixteen minutes has passed in the final hour of a hostage siege that has made headlines around the world. 
For four months, 72 men have been held hostage in the Japanese ambassador's residence in Lima, Peru. Mid-afternoon, as part of their prison-like routine, they sleep, not knowing when death may come. The 14 Tupacamaru guerrillas and their leader, Nesta Serpa, have slipped into their own routine. Lunch, courtesy of the Red Cross, and football matches in the Japanese ballroom. One of the hostages is not sleeping. He is Admiral Louis G.M. Pietri, a career military man and counter-terrorism expert. He was a founder member of Peru's special forces. For the four-month siege, he has been muttering away over his Bible. The young guerrillas think he's gone slightly mad. What they don't know is that his Bible hides a transmitter allowing him direct communication with intelligence chief Vladimiro Montesinos. Es el mar. Son 14 y 43. Aún no han comenzado los chanchos a jugar. Informaremos apenas esto se ve. GM Pietri's transmitter was smuggled into the Japanese ambassador's house in a Red Cross supply package. He also has found a pager so that Montesinos can silently respond. Por mi formación militar, yo nunca me consideré un... Being a military man, I never considered myself a hostage. I was a prisoner of war. Montesinos saw his opportunity when the Red Cross gained access to the hostages. The Red Cross was allowed inside the embassy to deliver food, water, and medicine. Unbeknown to them, the government had hidden microphones among the deliveries. A través de los termos. Microphones came in inside thermos flasks, in brooms, in boxes of fruit, even in portable toilets and religious articles, picture frames, anywhere they could put a tiny microphone. In all, 800 microphones were hidden in strategic positions around the building, letting Montesinos overhear everything every word that was spoken. GM Pietri needed to find a way to receive messages from the special forces commandos in the tunnels below. One of the hostages had managed to hide a pager in his pants. Él se acercó a mí y me dijo al mirante, a todos nos habían requisado los beepers. He approached me saying, Admiral, they took our beepers and our cell phones, but he'd been able to hide a beeper in his crotch. GM Pietri's task is to signal to Montesinos when Peruvian special forces should attack, with maximum damage to the terrorists and minimum loss of life to the hostages. The troops have been waiting since dawn the previous day. What is your condition? Aún en espera, señor. Los hombres han estado en alerta durante casi 32 horas. Solo esperen. Esperen la orden. For months, Vladimiro Montesinos has prepared for this day and this hour. Montesinos was a master of diversion. He distracted Serpa with a fake military attack. He blasted music at the building to cover the sound of digging in the tunnels. 30 coal miners from the Andes Mountains were hired to dig tunnels running under the ambassador's residence to be used for the military assault. They worked 24 hours a day, three meters below the ground. Every night, ambulances pass by the back of the ambassador's residence as if part of a standby medical team. In fact, they were Montesino's men taking away tons of earth coming out of the tunnels. Montesinos had a particular characteristic. Um, he would never let an opportunity go by. And he, he also has um, a great ability to create smoke screens, to use diversionary and distraction tactics. For GM Pietri, it is not a moment too soon. His fellow hostages are almost at breaking point. Most of them have been kept in the dark as the slightest wrong move could ruin the rescue plan. 
Nosotros estábamos entrando ya en una situación de desesperación que era peligrosa. We were so desperate that it was getting dangerous. I felt the same way. Some people weren't sleeping. Some cried at night. At any moment, someone could lose control. One wanted to use the string of my guitar to strangle the terrorists. Downstairs, time is also wearing on Serpa's young gorillas. Tito, trae la pelota. Serpa has used regular football matches to shake off the tedium, but kicking a makeshift ball around is hardly morale inspiring. Ya, terminen. Es hora de levantarse. Today's game could be the moment Gian Pietri has been waiting for. Over the weeks of inactivity and stalemate, Vamos. Nestor Serpa's lack of leadership skills and experience have become increasingly obvious to his troops. Nestor Serpa started as a, as a worker and rose to become a union leader. And he had a very traumatic experience with a strike that he was involved in in 1979. When the police intervened, um, seven of his comrades were um, were shot. Serpa joined the MRTA, which was a sort of classic left-wing um, Latin American guerrilla group, very much along the Che Guevara line. The MRTA um, started off robbing banks to get money. They did a number of Robin Hood-type activities. By 1997, the Tupac Amaru revolutionary movement had been defeated. Over 600 were in jail. Serpa's aim was to free his comrades and relaunch their Marxist cause. At the beginning of the siege, Serpa offered to free the hostages in exchange for the release of 465 Tupac Amaru guerrillas. Over the months, that demand fell to just 20. One name always topped the list. Right to the end, um, Serpa insisted on freedom for Nancy Hilvonio, his common law wife. I think for Serpa, Nancy Hilvonio was an absolute key piece. I don't think he was going to leave the embassy without some assurance that Nancy was going to be freed. Serpa had written a letter to his young son. Mi querida Nana, si algún día salgo de esta residencia japonesa, será porque conseguí lo que ustedes esperan y sueñan con que se haga realidad. My dear little one, if one day I leave this Japanese residence, it will be because I have found what you are hoping and dreaming of. Having your mother out of prison, coming home to see her, to touch her, to play with her, to be in her arms. If you write to your mother, tell her I love her more than ever. I love you. Your dad. Driven by political belief, ignited by love, Serpa's act was that of a desperate idealist. But more than three months of negotiation had led nowhere. Cuban President Fidel Castro had offered Serpa and his comrades asylum if they agreed to release the hostages. Now, Serpa was ready to capitulate. Serpa called a meeting. A microphone hidden on the coffee carafe transmitted every word to Montesinos.
El gobierno de Cuba está listo para recibirnos. Tú eres el líder, ¿no? Se supone que tienes que quedarte hasta el final. Abandonar la residencia sería como capitular ante ellos. Pongamos la voto. Mi voto es por abandonar la lucha. Y el mío es por continuarla. Por la liberación de todos nuestros camaradas en prisión. ¿Quién está conmigo? was split. The hardline was now in charge. When Montesinos heard this, the final plans for an attack were set in motion. On April the 21st, the day before the end, senior negotiator Archbishop Cipriani went to President Fujimori and asked him just to release Serpa's wife. Fujimori refused. The military option was now the only option. The strain was telling on the young and inexperienced revolutionaries. In desperation, one turned to Father Vict. I saw one of the girls was looking out the window. When she turned around, she had tears in her eyes. I asked her what was wrong. Padre, a mí me dijeron que esto iba a durar dos o tres días. Ya han pasado cuatro meses. Yo ya no quiero estar acá. Tranquila, muchacha. ¿Cómo hago para salir? Dios perdona nuestros pecados, nuestros errores. Solo él puede ayudar. Vamos a rezar. Poco a poco comprendieron que éramos gente pacífica. Little by little, they understood that we were peaceful people, good people. And little by little, we all became closer, which worried Serpa. She composed herself, suddenly went back to being a soldier, and walked away. 20 minutes have passed since Montesinos put his attack plan in motion. Now, the commandos are ready. The commandos trained for months in a full-scale replica of the building, memorizing each hostage and terrorist's face, so when the time came, they could tell friend from foe. Three separate tunnels provide commandos with surprise attack positions from the front, rear, side of the building. A fourth tunnel leads under the ballroom where the explosives are set. The first blast is designed to kill everyone in the ballroom on the ground floor. Ironically, this is where Tupac Amaru had originally been holding the hostages. But an unexpected and rash decision by Serpa had played into the government's hands. President Fujimori had told the world that he would handle the Tupac Amaru guerrilla takeover with negotiation and diplomacy. He met with the US President Bill Clinton and Japanese Prime Minister in Toronto, promising to bring an end to the siege without bloodshed. So when Serpa heard the tunnels being dug, he realized he'd been tricked by President Fujimori. An angry Serpa faced the press. Serpa furiously attacked the government and again made threats that the hostages would be killed. TV crews beamed the story around the world. 
the safety of the hostages was now on a knife edge. But Serpa's next action was a gift for Montesinos. They sent us all to the second floor. That's the measure he took. We were all put together on the second floor. Serpa sent the hostages upstairs and grouped his guerrillas downstairs in the ballroom so that they could confront the commandos if they stormed the building. It was a decision that would determine who would live and who would die. The guerrillas are playing directly above the tunnel, packed with explosives. Gian Pietri signals Montesinos to stand by. But before launching the attack, Gian Pietri must check that none of the guerrillas are close enough to the hostages to kill them. Upstairs in the next room, these hostages know nothing of the coming attack. Unwittingly, Father Vict invites one of the guerrillas to join him in a game of chess. ¿Quieres jugar? ¿Qué es? Se llama ajedrez. Es un juego de estrategia. After four months, few of the hostages expect a rescue attempt. Okay. Or for that matter, to live. On the ground floor in the ballroom, the two Pakamaru rebels are distracted by their football match and their own infighting. GM Pietri waits for an opportune moment to signal the attack. But still, there are too many guerrillas close to the hostages. The problem was that Mr. Agura was playing cards with the terrorists. rescue goes ahead while armed guerrillas are upstairs, they could slaughter scores of captives before the Peruvian special forces can get to them. Less than half an hour remains in a drama that has stretched out across four months. Most of the two Pakamaru guerrillas play football in the ballroom of the Japanese ambassador's residence. Upstairs are 72 hostages. Peruvian special forces have hidden for a day and a half in tunnels below, waiting for the order to strike. But government agent Admiral Luis Gian Pietri has a problem. There are too many guerrillas guarding the hostages for the rescue to succeed. Commandante nos quiere a todos abajo. Then guerrilla leader Nestor Serpa sends a message to the guards upstairs to come down and join the football. For the sake of a game of football, Serpa has made a fatal mistake. The only remaining guerrilla stands upstairs exposed by the large window. An easy target for snipers deployed on the roofs overlooking the residence. Montesinos' violent assault is primed. No plan is foolproof. 
But Montesinos has covered every base with admirable cunning. Publicly, Montesinos had gone through the motions of negotiation, but it was all a bluff. The fruitless talks were simply to buy him more time. Serpa had allowed Japanese and other journalists into the embassy. The two Pakamaru showed off their weapons and their prized captives. Serpa announced that the Peruvian foreign minister, Francisco Tudela, would be the first to be executed if there was a rescue attempt. What Serpa didn't know, that some of the journalists were actually Montesino's secret agents, gathering detailed video information for an attack. The intelligence chief also needed to be sure that the guerrillas had not mined the ground outside the building. He had ordered hundreds of rats released all around the Japanese ambassador's residence as mine detectors. No mines exploded. Montesinos now knew that he could launch a coordinated attack above ground as well as below. Yem Pietri tells Montesinos to seize the moment. During the siege, Admiral GM Pietri has only trusted a few men. Now the time has come to tell the other hostages about the rescue attempt. Amongst them, Peru's foreign minister, Francisco Tudela, the Tupac Amaru's prized hostage. The idea was that only a few of us would know so that no one could disagree and stop us. I told them to open the door. They looked at me. You're crazy. They're coming for us. There had been sarcastic jokes about being rescued. So when I heard we would be freed, I thought it was a joke. For four months, Father Vict has preached non-violence. If he helps Gian Pietri, Father Vict knows many may die, including possibly himself. Now the Jesuit peacemaker must decide which way to jump. Oh, Julio, tienes que ayudarme a mover el escritorio. Fue una prueba terrible. It was a terrible test. But we decided to resist. Father Vict makes his decision. He helps move the table which is blocking their escape route. The commando's plan is to free the hostages through these terrace doors. The night before, GM Pietri wrote to his family. He knew that if the building was attacked, the two Pakamaru would kill. And as a senior military man, he would be one of the first to be shot. I wrote my will and final farewell to my family. There was a huge internal struggle. Literally, to be or not to be. Vivir or no vivir. In other words, we were all very conscious that the Peruvian state could not give in to terrorism. But at the same time, we all wanted to live. It was particularly difficult knowing that if there was a military attack, at least 40% of us would die.
Only a few precious minutes remain before the football game is over, and the chance to free the hostages is lost. After four months, the bolts on the terrace doors have rusted shut. So we tried to open the door just a little because we were afraid that the door could be booby-trapped on the outside. The door opens safely. Word of the rescue plan spreads among the hostages. The radio is switched off. This is the pre-arranged signal for the hostages to take cover. They each looked for a place to hide. We had a task force ready to put everyone into the rooms. Some of the hostages are Japanese. One doesn't understand Spanish. One of us grabbed him and put him in a room. The window of time is closing fast. Montesino still needs President Fujimori to greenlight the attack. But at this vital moment, he can't reach the president, who's dealing with his own personal problems. Montesinos called Fujimori. Fujimori was in the Palace of Justice um, doing some routine procedure about his divorce. And uh, the assistant who answered Fujimori's mobile phone didn't want to pass Montesinos through. So Montesinos ended up yelling at the assistant down the phone in order to get put through to Fujimori so that Fujimori could give the order to go in. The conversation between intelligence chief Montesinos and President Fujimori was recorded. Perfecto. Procedan. After 32 hours of waiting, the commandos are on edge. It's now up to Gian Pietri to give the code to attack. Mari está enferma. Mari está enferma. Cuando yo terminaba con esa frase, significaba de que todos. When I said that, it meant that everyone was in the rooms, the hall was clear, the terrorists were downstairs, and the doors were open. Father Vict takes refuge against the wall and prays. But just as the countdown begins, things go horribly wrong. A helicopter almost wrecked the operation. I don't know why it was flying over the building just then, but the MRTA stopped playing football. Commando leader has to make a split-second decision. Sí, sí. Tres, dos, uno. Dale. The explosives fail to ignite. ¿Qué pasa, carajo? No sé. Y el oficial que estuvo abajo, 
tuvo un tiro seco. When the officer in the tunnel tried the first explosion, nothing happened. But they had backups for everything. Tenían duplicado. A car battery provides a quick low-tech backup plan. Six terrorists are killed instantly, and one, Serpa's right-hand man, Tito, lays dying. Serpa and seven others run upstairs, determined to kill the hostages. 140 commandos storm the building from all directions. The two Pacamaru face overwhelming odds. Porque el ingreso fue masivo, fue por. It was a massive attack. Everybody came in from ten different places at once. The commandos must get to the hostages before the guerrillas can kill them. Microphone in Admiral G.M. Pietri's Bible records the battle. Nestor Serpa is gunned down on the staircase trying to make it to the hostages. The man who led the two Pacamaru's daring plan now lies dying in a pool of his own blood. Nosotros siempre supimos que si sobrevivían a cualquier ataque, ellos iban a ir a buscar. We always knew if there was an attack and they survived, they would come and kill us, and that's exactly what happened. Y el encargado de la habitación mía. I saw the terrorist meant for us come into my room with my own eyes. He was looking for their prime target, Tudela. Commando takes the bullet meant for the foreign minister, Francisco Tudela. Tudela escapes, injured but alive. The commandos gain the upper hand, moving from room to room. Hostages, including Father Vict, are trapped by the crossfire. I thought it was a dream. It couldn't be real. It was freedom obtained in the most violent way, but freedom nonetheless. Admiral Gian Pietri escapes still holding the farewell letter he wrote the night before. Few people get to rehearse their own death. It gave me a great sense of peace. Well. In that moment, at that moment, I said to myself, "I'm alive. I finally knew I was alive." The microphone in Admiral G.M. Pietri's Bible records the end of the siege as the guns fall silent. Subsequent reports say the commandos fired as many as 500 bullets into Serpa's body. Critics called it an execution-style killing, bitter revenge against the man who humiliated Peru's leadership to a worldwide audience. Whether he died in a gunfight or was savagely executed, the truth may never be known. On April 22, 1997, the Japanese ambassador's residence in Lima had been retaken after a siege lasting 126 days. Peruvian President Alberto Fujimori and intelligence chief Vladimiro Montesinos were hailed for their victory over terrorism. The 14 Tupac Amaru terrorists were all dead. 
President Fujimori personally inspected their corpses for the TV cameras. The death of the, all the guerrillas was completely accepted. Nobody raised an eyebrow. Nobody questioned it. And later, of course, there were various stories that some of the MRTA had surrendered. Um, nobody much wanted to talk about things like that. Only one hostage was killed, Supreme Court Judge Carlos Giusti Acuna. Two commandos also died, Captain Raul Jimenez and Colonel Juan Valer, the man who took the bullet meant for Peru's foreign minister. The Tupac Amaru's violent gamble ended in their own tragedy. The organization effectively died with Nestor Serpa Cartellini. His sons, Nesta and Juan Carlos, now live in exile. His wife, Nancy, will be in jail for the rest of her life. Sally Bowen believes that the Peruvian government's violent solution to the hostage crisis was born out of their own humiliation. The military and the intelligence services had been made to look stupid. I mean, 14 guerrillas, most of them untrained, most of them very young, who come from the jungle, who'd never been in Lima before. And even if they didn't eventually gain their ends, um, was a real blow to the pride of the armed forces and the intelligence services. And they had to get revenge. Vladimiro Montesinos and President Fujimori were fated as heroes. But in an extraordinary twist, within two years, they would become outlaws. Vladimiro Montesinos was acclaimed for his role in the victory over terrorism. But it turned out that the Supreme Chief of Intelligence was using the war on terror to hide a network of corruption. Unlimited power for Montesinos meant virtually unlimited control over Peru's biggest business, cocaine. There's quite compelling evidence that Montesinos continued to ship cocaine out of Peru during the Japanese embassy siege, um, taking advantage of the fact that the eyes of the press were firmly fixed on what was going on inside the Japanese residence. In September 2000, Peruvian television transmitted a secret video recording. It showed Montesinos bribing a Peruvian politician. His empire of crime and corruption was revealed. By the time he had become Fujimori's co-power broker, he was really Peru's drugs kingpin. He took a percentage on every shipment of cocaine that left Peru. Montesinos fled the country, but was captured in June of 2001. When he fell, he took Peruvian President Fujimori down with him. In the end, Fujimori could not survive without Montesinos. He also um, fled the country not long after Montesinos left, about oh, a couple of weeks, he went off to an international conference in Brunei and um, never came back. He sent a fax telling the Peruvian people that he was resigning. Just like that, the president was gone. Vladimiro Montesinos remains in a Peruvian prison, awaiting a sentence that would put him behind bars forever. But the jailed cocaine czar saga may not be over yet. remnants of his power and the threat, I think, that he could possibly return someday, um, that he could be released from jail um, and come and start collecting some of the debts that he thinks that people owe him, remains very present in Peru. Father Vict was awarded Peru's National Human Rights Prize for his support of the hostages. 
La violencia no es solución. La... Violence is no solution. Violence only breeds violence, hate, resentment, and death. After the siege, Admiral Jean Pietri went into politics and was elected vice president of Peru in 2006. Esto no fue una una cosa circunstancial y esa es una de las razones. This wasn't a chance thing. Porque creo it was one of the reasons I got into politics. Because I really think that if this country doesn't change, our society could explode. A violent guerrilla, a corrupt henchman, and a deceptive politician. The actions of each of these three men contributed to their tragic downfall. One dead, two disgraced in a countdown to catastrophe. Six months after the siege, Japanese ambassador's residence was knocked down. Peru wiped away all evidence of a house bathed in blood.